Friday afternoon, folks. Uh, Halloween. Happy Halloween to you all. Ted Ralston here in the Think Tech Hawaii Studios uh, downtown Honolulu. Uh, one of our most uh, honored and favored guests, uh, Jay Fidel, sitting here next to me. And we have uh, uh, Pudding with his, with his uh, Halloween costume on. We have one of our friends from the uh, Lava Fields in Pahoa here sitting on the mm -hmm. table. Mm -hmm. Where the Road Leads is the name of our show. We run different episodes about how technology uh, can help us determine where that road's going, how to get down that road, and uh, technology, of course, being equipment and systems as well as the art of solving problems, a lot of which is dealing with bringing people together, exchanging ideas, uh, gathering information from different points of view, and working out problems that work, working out solutions that work for all of us. Uh, today, the episode is called uh, When the Lava Meets the Road. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> And, uh, as I really all, like that, by the well, way. Well, I like triple entendre. Up here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, lava certainly is meeting the road, covering the road, blocking the roads over on the other end of this state, over in Pahoa, and that's going to be the situation for the next couple of years, I suspect. And uh, we wanted to take a look at that and how how technology, uh, in the various forms we're talking about here, can help us by informing, by preparing, by planning, and by reacting and maybe in some respects by thinking about what to do afterwards. Are we going to re resettle housing downhill from a volcano? That you know, it seems like it's it a problematic situation. Issues, yeah. yeah, it sure does. It does, uh, it does a lot. Marty and I were out having a talk in, on the windward side of this island, and we now understand how the windward side sheared off from the shield volcano. and Isn't that an with, exciting with story? A it is fantastic. Incredible, yeah. And you know, sooner or later, if you live on a shield volcano, you have that risk. So it, it's something we need to all think about. In any case, there's uh, ways to think about this from the point of view of a volcanologist, which would be a highly technically oriented uh, uh, perspective, I believe, mathematics and physics and things like that. And we happen to have one online. Dr. Peter Webley from the University of Alaska Fairbanks is online with us. Hello, Peter. Hi there. And we wanted to get his perspectives and his points of view on this. We'd also like to add the boots on the ground perspective. That's the civil defense people and our people at UH Hilo who are beginning to add UAVs into the equation of um, sensing what's going on and, and doing uh, work in, in dealing with reaction. And then we have, of course, uh, they're all out working today, so that's why they're not on the Skype along with those of us who aren't working. And then um, then we have also the big picture people over at the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center who think about this in context of geologic issues and urban planning and how do we think about that and plan and prepare. Uh, we'll have them on at a later time uh, after the tech, some of them are just getting back from the Big Island right now. But to start with, Peter, you know what's going on out here, I think. Uh, the last time we had you on the, on the, on the show, we were maybe a half mile away. Uh, lava wasn't quite there yet, it's now there. And uh, from your perspective, Peter, what, what are your thoughts about uh, the technology that we could have used or that we should use or we might want to use to inform ourselves about what is, uh, what is coming up next? Give us your thoughts, your insight from the perspective of a professional volcanologist. By the way, I think I met you. you. You were on Star Wars, weren't you? <laughs> Star Trek, Star Trek. And yes. you come from a planet that's very far away. Called I Alaska. do come a planet You look a lot like away. Dr. Spock. Yeah. Yes, and my, my, my home planet is across the sea and across the ocean. <laughs> that um, may being be a, true. Being a Brit. Across the sea and across the ocean, but Hawaii and, and Alaska are joined by their common interest in the common <laughs> challenges of volcanoes, amazingly. Exactly. We, we have a common interest. So, yeah, the. In terms of um, looking at it on a volcanogenic uh, perspective, there's two things that you can do. Is you're really looking to plan and understand what the hazard could do. So you'd be looking at modeling where the flow would go. You would look at the uh, descent of the topography, and you try and model the, the impact of the uh, changing lava flow a week or two weeks in, um, into the future. Um, you'd be using satellite data, you'd be using ground observations to best understand what's happening to the volcano and as it's um, descending down the uh, local topography and looking at the images that are coming in from, from yesterday, from 
the USGS uh, Hawaii Volcano Observatory, it's looking like it's moved 120 meters in the last day or so, flowing down in a sort of northeasterly direction towards the Pahoa Village Road. So it, it's been descending down the uh, topographic slope over the last couple of weeks since we last spoke, and it, it still seems to be moving in that direction, maybe a little slower. They were mentioning that um, if I look at their data from earlier today, uh, actually from yesterday, that they were saying that it slowed a little, but it's still moving um, at about 100 meters a day. Let me take a, a quick break here. We just will get back in a minute, but there's an interesting uh, aspect of technology here. Here we have Peter, who's up 5,000 miles away on some other planet, analyzing something taking place dynamically right here in our backyard. That is pretty amazing, if you ask me. But let's take a technical break. We have a technical adjustment to make. We'll be back in 30 seconds. Yeah. <clears throat> I need a headset. I Hi, I'm Ethan Allen. I'm the host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about why people should like science, why science is actually fun, how science is a dynamic and vital part of everyone's life, why everyone, every man, woman, and child on the planet should really know science, should love science, should be familiar with science. So it's a great show. People come on here and have interesting conversations with us. They tell us why they do what they do, why they love it, why we should love it too. I hope you'll join us every Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. And of course, you can see it anytime on YouTube. Aloha. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is our flagship show, which plays 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. And the, uh, the supporters of that show are uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and uh, Hawaii Energy. And luckily enough, we have representatives of both of them right here today to tell you more about what they think about the show. Uh, Sharon Moriwaki at my left is uh, co-chair of Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and she goes first. Sharon? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I'm so glad that we have this Hawaii, the state of clean energy. This was uh, two years ago when we started this, and we have continued it because it's so important. And there's so many developments happening across the state. We hope you'll tune in every Wednesday, 4 to 5. It's wonderful. And uh, Ray is uh, Hawaii Energy. Ray, what is your thought about the same subject? Well, I, I agree completely with Sharon uh, that uh, we are talking about every Wednesday, 4 to 5, uh, we talk about some of the most important subjects that uh, are affecting the islands uh, now and into the future. Uh, energy clean energy. We need it. Uh, we often run into uh, new ideas that we had not uh, thought about before. Uh, we did just today, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think we're going to have more of that uh, in the future. So uh, come on down and, uh, and watch us uh, 4 to 5 on Wednesdays, um, and we'll uh, see what happens. We'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha. Friday afternoon, folks. Think Tech Studios, downtown Honolulu. Ted Ralston here, your host on Where the Road Leads. Uh, we just took a momentary technical break here. We had an official review, and the uh, decision was on the field was upheld, I believe. <laughs> and so we've made that correction, and our behavior should be improved as we go forward here. We've got Peter Webley, Dr. Peter Webley, up at the University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, online with us. And we were just having uh, Dr. Webley tell us uh, the first steps that a volcanologist thinks about as he deals with the circumstances of the type that are unfolding in Pahoa at the very beginning of this uh, two-year run of lava to the sea. Peter, would you restate those three factors that are important to you, and then we'll play into how they are affected by the technology we can develop? And again, the yeah, most amazing thing to me is we got a guy 4,000 miles away dealing with an event taking place in our backyard right here. That, that is pretty darn really good. good. Yeah. So yeah, that actually makes shows how technology can, can bring the world closer together um, and allow, and allow um, a larger group of people to get involved in a potential um, hazardous event. So in terms of volcanology, the first one I, I was mentioning was that we would want to try and model where the flow would go. Um, as we've seen with the, the recent images from the overflights from the USGS, that we've got the flow moving down in a northeasterly direction uh, towards Pahoa. So we'd want to model where that will be in the next week or 10 days, really for evacuations, for safety, and to best better prepare the local community. Um, we'd also make use of technologies available, uh, not only what we, have, we would have in an observatory itself, 
but other data sets uh, that could be brought to bear starting from satellite data all the way down to ground observations. So you would look at uh, ground, air, and, and space uh, observations because you're really trying to get the best data available into the hands of those that can then better prepare the, the local population. But how can you um, make a prediction as to exactly where the lava flow is going to go? I give you variable. I give you the uh, height over, over the ground. Yeah. I give you the heat. I suppose you can measure that pretty easily. I yeah. give you the existing flow, and I give you a topographical map of the area right. so you can see which way you know and the, the land is bending. Yes. Uh, how accurate can you be in determining uh, when and in what you know intensity the flow is going to arrive at a certain spot? Yeah, very, very good question. It, it all comes down to probabilities and statistics. Is that you say, well, we the the depth at a certain location is. At, at um, so many meters plus or minus um, the accuracy of the measurement. And we have the heat plus or minus the accuracy of the measurement. We have the topography plus or minus its accuracy. Add them all together, and then you would run the model, and you would look at the highest probability, which of all of those inputs would tell you the most likely direction. You might have something with a 70 or 80 percent probability. So no matter what you, the accuracy of your measurement, it's still going to flow in that direction. So you would put a probability, and then somebody would use that to say, well, that's a high probability of a hazard. Therefore, that's the area we need to focus on. If the probability is lower, it's then up to the decision maker to determine if that's still a hazardous area. So Peter, given all of that, I just, that, that was my first question. I have, my, I got, my I have two questions. to follow up to yours. Yeah, we have a lot of questions. So you're yeah. in trouble, Peter. Okay. <laughs> so, so, okay. So how much time do you need? you know, to determine a flow. In other words, how far in advance of a given intersection event can you start making these predictions? Uh, and I put it more factually, when did you fir first became aware, when did you first become aware, uh, you know, that Pahoa was at risk? Uh, when, when were you first in a position, uh, you know, to, to uh, project exactly when the flow, I mean, subject, subject to change, who knows what, but uh, when did you become aware that, that th there would be, a, a, you know, a flow into Pahoa? How long, in it, how long in advance did you know that? Well, that's not something that I could give you an answer to personally. That would be a question for the USGS and the Volcano Observatory. Um, and they have specialists in lots of disciplines, one of them being flow modeling. Um, each observatory will have specialists in the areas of the hazards that, that they're dealing with. Um, so they would be seeing to the was this first detected uh, flow from the June the 27th. So that day they would have been modeling the speed of where the flow can go in the next 24 to 48 hours. So they're always looking for that short term. Where is it going to be such that if there's a if there's a need to to evacuate, then that information can be passed on to the local authorities, be it. Uh, those dealing with the police, those dealing with um, um, the fire service, whoever needs to be involved in the evacuation. So a lot of it is passing the information to the group that would then make the decision. You wouldn't probably have the Hawaii Observatory on, um, saying evacuate this community because their job is the volcano. Their job is understanding what the volcano is doing. But they would pass that information to whoever is the head of the evacuation group and say, this is our information. Now it's up to you given that to make your decision. And this is where the training center, the, uh, the disaster preparedness training center that Ted mentioned earlier, where they come in is that they have these courses that integrate the volcanologic uh, portion and the disaster management groups in terms of training. So they understand what information observatory would tell them. So you asking that question, how long would you know before you can say Pahoa would be impacted? Well, by taking this course, the training people would understand that sort of answer. How quickly could an observatory give them the information they would need to then know what to do for, for um, safety management? Mm -hmm. So this is truly an art. There's, there's technology bit embedded in here, modeling and simulation and analysis and such, but the relationship between people, the trust that's built up, I mean, I, we're hearing an extremely confident delivery here of a really complicated problem that's affecting a lot of people. And it's, it's uh, obvious people have been thinking about this for a long time and been through it before. But the, once again, the fact that we've got Peter looking at this from a remote site, 
this implies to me that we could have people around the world, specialists in different types that are uh, assisting in some way. Mm -hmm. Peter, what kind of a network do you all represent in terms of the specialists who can step in here on call? Well, that's actually a very good question. We, we have uh, what's called the World Organiza Organization of Volcano Observatories. It's a commission of a, of a large group, and I'm actually the America's uh, representative for that. And we try to integrate the world's volcano observatories. So um, I know that within the United States Geological Survey, they have a lot of um, personnel transfer between observatories if needed. Um, I know here in Alaska, when we've had large volcanic um, events, that there's always been the, um, a transfer of people to prevent burnout, but to also bring in expertise into that community. So I, I would see that Hawaii, if required, could obviously call on the other observatories in the United States for any expertise that they would want. That Obviously, you get that with uh, the USGS being the, the um, federal agency that they can pull in all their different uh, experts from, from within their organization. Globally, that's also possible as well. Go ahead, Jay. Yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, we don't have too many of these uh, lava flows intersecting with roadways in, in Pahoa. I mean, you know, it happens every, what, 10, 30 years or something like 20, that. 10, yeah. 20, I remember a couple of times, but oh, that doesn't happen very often. And it probably doesn't happen in Alaska very often either. So no. my, my question is, I mean, this is this is sounding more and more like a great job, you know. My question, and Peter, is what do you do in the meantime? I was well, before you answer you. that, Peter. It, <laughs> let, let me. Uh, that was a setup question. Let me just uh, apologize for that in advance. But the the real observation is that this is our view here on a small little segment of Latin Long where we live. The world has a lot of volcan volcanic events going on everywhere, and my guess is that this network is in 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 uh, in constant operation just because of the around the world so much uh, distrib uh, so much of this type of. Uh, oh. That's a good guess. Let's speculate let's, what, what, what I, his I answer just speculated. Might be. Okay, I've got a speculation too. Okay. My speculation is like yours, is, is that uh, Peter is actually running a global thing here, and uh, you know, using the information he gets from these other regions in the world, uh, and uh, you know, sort of networking on exactly what is happening with uh, you know volcanic activity everywhere, he can sort of get an idea about how. All of this is working at the same time. Because how the mantle of the Earth is working at a given time. That's pretty exciting. So that's our two speculations, on which are pretty much the same, I think. But yeah. Peter, your reaction to our uh, speculations here, if you will. You can douse them all, if you wish. <laughs> um, so the question was, um, what do we do in the meantime when there's not a, uh, a lava flow going into a community like we're having in Pahala? Well. We're actually researching to get better at our capabilities. So when an event happens, we have the best tools available. So we do a lot of uh, research in the background, improving detection techniques, modeling techniques, using the best available. One of the, I see on your table, you've got a UA, UAV. UAVs are only just getting into the volcano community. And um, if, there's not a, if the, the activity reduces, then people will go back and tweak the technology tweak the cameras, the capabilities, the, the, the tools of the trade to when there's the next event, the, new, the newest capabilities available. So, so are, are you guys saying that the, that the UAV is going to help, um, uh, help predict when the flow is going to come, uh, where the flow is going to go, or is the UV, UAV uh, more like to help us um, deal with the people who are in the way of the flow? Or is it all of the all of the foregoing? I'll give you my answer, and then okay, Peter okay, will well, check it. It's all. I of love the above. doing the answer before I, the that, guest takes right. the answer. Again, another yeah, Peter, we want you know we want sort of you know we want to help you answer these questions by giving you the false answers in, you know at the beginning. And then you get to and sort then you them can out, correct Peter. us. Right. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it has a kind of tension to it. You know. I, I would like to well hear Peter. Then what I'd like to talk about is what's taking place in Pahoa today with UAV. Yeah. And the reason this one's on the table here. Yeah. But, Peter, your thoughts on uh, this emergence of uh, uh, miniaturization and in close uh, proximity observation, UAVs? Um, so a good, very good question about um, how will UAVs be integrated in. And I think they, it is all of the above. But in terms of the prediction, what you're really looking to do is forecasting. You need an observation. You need something to constrain your forecast. So if you want to say, where's the flow going to be in two weeks, you need an observation of where the flow is today. 
Um, and you're not always going to have a manned vehicle that you can get up there. You may be limited by availability, safety, um, time of day. Um, so UEVs become a new tool in that capability of, of an observatory or a scientist. Um, so they'll give you an observation that, we, that can help you do the forecasting. And then that observation can be used to map out where, which, which areas are at most risk without actually having to send a person there who themselves would then be put at risk. And let me clarify the word observation. I mean, it sounds to me, and uh, you can expand on this, is that an observation means a visual observation. It means a photograph observation. Um, uh, and that's not, you know, that's not a lot of data to fill up a spreadsheet and a database worth of data to make predictions and modeling and whatnot. Is there some other kind of data you're getting out of these UAVs aside from simple photographs of what's, you know, on, on the ground? Let me try and answer that, and then we'll get Peter <laughs> to correct us. I, I love oh, this Me too, because, you know, we can say whatever we want, and Peter will take care of us. Peter, but, I want uh, you to sell, tell him he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, certainly, uh, photogrammetry is an important part of that, but the reason this is sitting on the table here is because it's got an infrared camera on it, kind of going to the question you asked, so the folks can see it, but uh, this little guy here is a FLIR 640 that's been slaved to the rest of the, uh, the vehicle. So we can pick up at dusk or even during the daytime and at night, pick up sig significant heat signatures. This is actually calibrated to find people and animals, but it can be recalibrated to pick up the temperatures associated with lava. And uh, so we have the ability to get this sort of thing into the picture that might have cost a lot of money and been very difficult to uh, operate in the past. And, and also, something like this with infrared can get in and see through the, the, ha the haze and the, and the other factors that are uh, blocking the, the, uh, the color camera uh, views. So this is one example here. But we've been asked, uh, in fact, this exact unit, or a copy of it that's over on the Big Island, is going through the certification process with the FAA to make sure we uh, don't uh, violate any, any of the rules here. And I will say that the operations that the guys have going in Paho are teaching us uh, how that's going to work. We've all, that, that work's being done in total compliance with the FAA, which is uh, really a, a good experience to get through. But there's many kinds of sensors. Infrared supplements the color. We can put uh, 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 chemical characterization of the gases in the atmosphere in, in determining that, should there be issues of the people who are uh, 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 subject to uh, various kinds of uh, gases. And, and beyond the sensors, there's the analysis that goes with them. There's the conversion of the, uh, the imagery data into point clouds and other forms of, of reconciliation so that you can look at landforms and predict some of the things that Peter needs, the volume of the accumulated flow and, and the, the uh, lifting of it and such over time. So the UAVs can get you get in there, look, get, get a small area covered quickly at low cost and zero risk. And if we do them, do it with expendable systems, such as this one, if we lose it, it's not the end of the day. So, Peter, that's my answer to the question that Jay raised. We need you to rectify, clarify, and straighten that one out. The short answer is ditto. Um, <laughs> a perfect example and a perfect answer to the question. It's the, the biggest step is the thermal infrared, and then you can go on from there. You can go to larger UAVs. You can look at using LIDAR, which is laser ranging for, for flow um, out height. You can look at flow thickness, which gives you those volumes. And so visual observations is just one of them. I would say it's a measurement of, because it's not just a photograph that we would think of for the digital camera, but it's an actual measurement of the volcanic flow. Mm -hmm. If you've got temperatures in an area, you can start to look at speeds. If you're able to capture multiple images of the same spot at one time, you can work out its flow features. Um, you're not limited by having to have daylight if you're using infrared, um, which means you can get 24-7 coverage, which is critical for a um, developing hazard. So ditto to, to, to Ted's response, but that's my add-on to it. You know, a lot of people <laughs> think that when these UAVs go up and they look at a given uh, object, um, they're, they're high. I mean, they're as high as in your mind's eye your last recollection of, a, of a, say, a video or a photograph from a UAV would be. Um, but it strikes me that there are optimum, optimum altitudes here. And in the case of a volcanic flow, 
you don't necessarily want to be at 500 feet or 1,000 feet. You may want to be flying right over that sucker, you know, like a, just a six feet or so over the flow, uh, because you can get a better readout on some of these scientific observations. So is there a, a pattern that you use when you use the UAV to monitor a volcanic flow? And what is the altitude that it would be best? That, if I can answer that question, uh, and once again, we'll do our, our drill here. Peter will straighten us out when we blow it on this end. <laughs> Uh, the, that, that's a really good question, be, and that comes up over and over again. It came up uh, last week heavily. Margie and I were up at Reno at the American Society of Photo Analysts and Re Remote Sensing Specialists, and the, large, the, the most strong comment coming out of that was, as we're flooding the, uh, the, the system with capabilities such as this, we really have to stand back and ask what the user needs. What decision does the user have to make? What information will allow him to make a, the right decision? And how can we get it there the quickest? And it may not be the traditional answer that we've come to know. And therefore, precision is one thing, accuracy is another thing, just pure situational awareness is yet another thing. And these all have different time increments and, and cost values that are associated with them and the sensor packages. So as these capabilities become available, it's very easy for the folks who develop the capabilities to get out ahead of the people who are doing the analytic software and, and the decision making at the incident commander level. And that, we've learned that lesson here up in Makakilo on the fire and uh, the guys in, in uh, Pahoa are, are working in that direction now. Everything they do with the UAVs that they're flying, it really needs to support what the incident commander's mission is. And that may change from day to day or during the day. And uh, so understanding what his mission and needs are drives them in terms of what they're going to collect and how they're going to collect it and uh, image it. Peter, take it away. Very good answer. Um, and I, and the, the question of, of, of the altitude, it, it then comes down to the points you made of accuracy and precision. If you think of it's um, a, a FLIR camera that's on a UAV is not your 10 megapixel SLR camera. It's a smaller image. So the closer you are to the ground, the smaller the uh, pixel is of the feature. So the higher up you get, the coarser your image becomes. So if you're a thousand feet up, your image will be, your temperatures will not be as accurate as if you're 10 feet from the ground because you'll be averaging over a larger area. Let's, so, uh, let's, let's uh, hold that for a moment and get back to this very interesting discussion because that issue of the mission driving the, the resolution you need is going to is really important for us all to think about. It's a big factor here at UH as the UAV program builds and, uh, and within the world of the UAV uh, industry. But let's take a break and come right back to that question. Aloha, I'm Kelee Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. One of the things I love being, however, is the host of the weekly program on Think Tech Hawaii called Ehana Kako which means let's work together. I get to interview movers and shakers in our town and across the world so that you and I together can learn and to grow. Please join me every Monday from 2 to 3 p.m. or watch us on the recording www.thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and ehana kako. Let's work together. Ted Ralston, Think Tech Studios, downtown Honolulu, folks, where the road leads, our weekly program at 4 o'clock. Our guest here in the studio is uh, your name, sir? <laughs> Jay Fidel. Jay Fidel, okay. But right. you knew that. <laughs> not, not, not nice, but. And we have Dr. Peter Webley up at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, our volcanologist specialist on the line. Uh, we're talking about the use of technology and the evolution of what the technology needs must be in order to serve these global missions, such as what the volcanologists are uh, are involved in, and we uh, talked a little bit, of, we talked a lot about the from the volcanologist volcanologist perspective. We're beginning to talk a little bit about the boots on the ground perspective, and we still have the big picture uh, from the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center to bring into the discussion in subsequent weeks. But this issue that we were speaking of just before the break was. In, in my mind, the most uh, fundamental thing that the analysts have to think about here and the, and the production, the people who make these products and design them, and that is what are we really going to do with the information so we can get the right sensors at the right scale at the right time and in there. And as Peter was saying, 
uh, these different sensors will all have a different optimum setting in terms of altitude or overlap or uh, uh, factors of the ranges in which they can operate of sunlight or, or, or such. This one, this, this particular Fleur 640, as Peter mentioned, is a, is a fairly low, gra uh, low uh, resolution camera. It optimizes at about maybe 100 to 200 feet in its primary mission of search and rescue. So as, as a good example, we have it available, therefore we're going to use it. We don't know if that's the right answer or how optimum that answer is in the particular case of lava. My, I might add, Peter, uh, we also have interest here through our University of Hawaii program of using infrared for other things that aren't just volcanoes. We have subterranean groundwater discharge, which is an issue that requires resolutions of a couple of tenths of a degree to figure out where the cold water is entering the ocean. And we have people looking for ungulates and, uh, that are inside a compound that may be uh, an invasive species control area. And once the pigs get in, they mess it up carrying seeds around, so we want to find them. So what's the delta T and the resolution required to pick up animals? But Peter, this, this to, to, to my mind, especially after attending the conference last week in Reno that we mentioned, uh, how do we work with the, especially at the University of Hawaii program we're just starting up here, how do we take the volcanologist's needs, as you began to articulate, and convert them into sensor needs and begin thinking of our programs here aligning themselves with development of sensors that match the mission. How do we take the various forms and components and elements of the mission that you deal with and your group of experts around the world and segregate them down or distribute them down into the types of sensors and resolution? I'm repeating myself, but it, it sounds like a pretty important question. No, let me, uh, let me add an, in, 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 in sort of an interstitial remark. And, and that is this, you know, three years ago, this wasn't available. <laughs> Four years? Hey, I know where you're going. You know, yeah. you couldn't get these, you, you right. couldn't get sensors in position unless you wanted to take a walk in a very hot mud, um, <clears throat> which was not, not advisable. Um, so, you know, now we have this platform, now we can put all these sensors on there. Uh, and, and so that must change volcanology profoundly. It must, because now you have all these possibilities. It's, it's like um, you can think of things to do. Every, every time you make an advance and get to the next step, you can think of all the other advances you want to make. And so in the space of a, only a few years, it seems to me, that volcanology as applied to search and rescue, for example, uh, has been profoundly changed. Am I right about that, Peter? You are. I, I think the the technology over the last probably 10 years, I'd say, I've, I've got my, I can bring up my iPhone, I've got my iPhone here, and five, six years ago, they were, they were something that not everybody had, and we're now at the point where people tweet if they feel an earthquake. So technology has definitely changed science. Um, and I think in terms of the, the question about sort of the, how the UAV program can move forward is, if you're thinking of sort of building a system to map lava flows and you're looking at a thermal camera, well, what other applications can it be used for? So it's not just a UAV for volcanology, but it's a UAV for search and rescue. Is the accuracy needed for search and rescue the same accuracy needed for volcanology or for monitoring water, um, to ocean temperature changes? We're looking here about designing a camera that could be useful for looking at glacial movement, as well as looking for hot targets at volcanoes. Um, and for, for hot targets at volcanoes, you're looking at a background temperature of the ground compared to something that's at several hundred degrees. So we don't, we don't need that 0.1 degree accuracy of temperature, because we've got three or 400 degrees of temperature between our hot and cold feature. Glaciers, it's the inverse. They're looking at temperatures in the negative 20s and 30s, right at the end of the temperature range of the sensor. So you, by building something that can be applied to multiple disciplines, makes the program more applicable to the, all of the research done across the state of Hawaii. And that then leads back to the question, how do we distill and extract those, that insight from the user community, such as Peter, and bring it forward to the developing community, such as represented by this camera and this UAV? And I'll go back it's to an experience factor. I mean, for example, uh, you know, I was thinking as you were talking, Ted, about 
say a flood. Now, maybe the flood that Chuck Devaney went to see in uh, the Philippines, um, you know, some kind of devastation. And so you don't know who's out there, and you, you need to know, and you need to cross a kind of no man's land to get there, uh, and you need to survey what's going on there and who, if anybody, is there. Uh, and, for example, um, the infrared might tell you that there's somebody under, under a pile of rubble that you wouldn't be able to see with the naked eye. Uh, so it's identifying the, the victims, identifying the objects of the search and rescue. Um, in, the, in the one case, um, you know, it's, it's the people in the way of the lava. In the other case, it's the people who are, you know, in the flood and don't have a way out. So I think, you know, I mean, I, you know, my, my experience, by the way, I was in the Coast Guard for a while. Um, so I can, this is resonant for me. Uh, so it seems to me that th this opens a whole new world. And actually, the, the vul volcanologists who are looking at the lava and the people who are in the way of the lava are learning lessons that can be used in the flood. And, you know, and it's common denominator. So and the way we need to think about this, and again, I'll go back to the conference last week, it was a whole bunch of technical specialists who deal with really exotic ways to take photographs and other forms of imagery and make something out of them. But there wasn't anybody there from the ultimate user community saying, here's what I need. And I think that uh, I'm sure that takes place elsewhere. So I'm just thinking that there's a string of conferences around the world every year that uh, four or five of them are the critical ones for something like UAVs. We really need to find a way to get that user voice brought into those conferences so that the right things can be developed. Uh, let, let's just run a test on our our our, uh, our victim here, Peter. <laughs> Peter, have you had a chance to express the views you've got in this in this sensor need domain in a way that the UAV community, as a as an example, could could digest it and and bring it into the development process? Yes, I have. I'm very fortunate here at the university that we have a unmanned aero vehicle sensor. Um, and I'm actually communicating on a fairly regular basis with their developers, especially for uh, building a compatible UAV that would have the resolution needed for a volcanic thermal features. Um, and you've met some of them when you came up to the meeting in Anchorage from the Aquasi Center. Um, and actually two of those colleagues are, are just down the corridor from me. So we have a continuous every few days or day just discussion about techniques, technology, needs. There is also a big um, conference that happens in December every year called, um, called the American Geophysical Union Conference in San Francisco, where you have specialists from all over these disciplines, from hydrology to meteorology to, to, to geology to, to, to technology development. Um, and we, I'm actually involved in, in some uh, groups that are bringing together um, and presenting on how UEVs have been applied into the scientific field. And I think that's where you can have a few of the people from the specialist community that maybe were at that Reno meeting, and then a group that have their own specialist scientific conference. They meet at a yearly um, conference, either at the, uh, something like this American Geophysical Union or equivalent, where it's a special session on application of UAVs for scientific research or application of UAVs for hazard assessment. Um, and you have both groups talking, and then they go off into their own communities and spread the word. So once again, in this case, the art of technology, in many cases, getting people together, sharing information, gaining that information to affect how somebody else operates and, and thinks about his product. So the American Geophysical Union, I think is what we heard about as one. But it struck me also what Peter was talking about. The um, University of Alaska is associated with the Alaska State Site for UAV development. The University of Hawaii is associated with the Hawaii State Site. And I'm sure the same is true in Nevada. I know it is true in Nevada. And the Mid-Atlantic the Mid Group and the uh, Texas and North Dakota. So one thought here is that maybe what the, the six state sites ought to be thinking of is, is becoming the, the, the suction that goes to the various uh, users in their areas and pulls in this information. Uh, to stay ahead of the power curve, as they say in aviation. Well, it's changing. I mean, as, as uh, Peter said, and as we all said, the technology is changing and, and at a rapid rate, profoundly. Uh, he's affected, but everybody's affected. And I think one of, the, one of the points that we should make before we close the show, 
is the comparison between the, the people in Pune and Pahoa who don't want to leave, despite scientific advice that they are in danger and should leave, uh, and the woman in Augusta, Maine, uh, who didn't want to be quarantined, even though health officials had told her she was within the quarantine period and presented a public health, a uh, public threat, a public threat, a public I got threat it. to public health. I think health. we got, get what you're talking about, right. Yeah, okay. okay, so I mean, there's a comparison there. Science takes us to further predictions and allows us to warn people. And what's unresolved here is whether they are obligated to accept our warnings. Interesting point, and, and therefore there's a social license associated with this as well. And, and the more we can work together with specialists, Peter, and the state units and, and these uh, groups like the American Geophysical Union to, uh, to get this information to flow so that everybody is reacting to it as best they can, that'll increase the apparent value and the real value, and that generates the social license that will take something like new emerging technology and make it useful. Uh, in the in the sphere of the world, so what a fascinating uh, discovery! One of, this is an unscripted program, as you know. We don't plan anything other than the people who are going to be on it, and we just try to discover things by having this kind of a conversation. So we'll uh, be closing off here in a minute. But Peter, if we could uh, do two things: one, um, secure your promise to come on this show like about every six weeks as the Pahoa situation uh, emerges over the next couple of years until the island gets bigger, and uh, and have your reaction to just what we talked about today and how you think we might be able to use this show to get this awareness out to the people watching it, in particular to the kids in the scholastic range, uh, K through 12, and the uh, academic range. Peter. Yeah, I'd be happy to, to be involved. Um, I can provide you with any insights from my experience of working in the past in Volcano hazard assessment and my continued work and, and the technologies that are out there and as I continue to work with our test center up here then I can then I can communicate some of the, the thoughts and developments as we build some of these capabilities for looking at volcanoes and and it's really sort of what technology is out there that can pre better prepare and better um, advise those on the ongoing hazard and it's as, as you said Jay there's there's people that they have their personal decision and and it's up to them what, what they will do, but they will be given the best advice, and then they will make that choice. Fascinating. So I think that's what the Think Tech Hawaii is all about, Jay, is getting people to think about these things uh, and working together towards reducing problems, if not solving them, and technology is a main element in that. So we want civic and scientific engagement to the max, here and elsewhere. Well, you know, there's a, that's, that's another... We've had that discussion here before about all of the whole of community involvement, and I think the science component is part of that community involvement. And we have an opportunity with uh, folks who've been on the show before to bring them back and talk about the Hawaii exemplary state. I just think we might have extended that to Alaska now with Peter, who is one of our one of our charter members. So I thank you for making this show available. I think this is fascinating how it generates this kind of dialogue, and and uh, it doesn't come with answers that are precast, we kind of discover them along the way, which is all about uh, where the path leads, where the road leads. We're not quite sure where it leads. Information will help us inform where it leads. Every now and then we run into some lava and then we have to do something about it. And that'll restart the cycle. Here's the needs. Here's the technology. Let's go work the problem. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Peter, we thank you very much once again for joining us here from uh, uh, Alaska to Hawaii. And again, the, I'll just say it about the fourth time today, the ability to bring somebody in from the outside, just for our show, let alone the reality of how they help in, in the local situation, is just fascinating. And I, I just look at that as, a, as a, great, uh, a, a great measure of how we've moved forward here, and technology's been the under, underlying enabler of all of that. Thank you tell, very much, Peter. Tell us Peter. how you really feel, Ted. That's how I feel. <laughs> Peter, we thank you very much and uh, appreciate your dedication here at uh, 9 o'clock at night, uh, still working, and uh, yeah. love that uh, work ethic. So, folks, uh, Ted Ralston, Jay Fidel, Peter up in Alaska, we'll uh, bid you a fine weekend and, and go out and do the trick-or-treating as appropriate for Halloween. See you next week. Aloha. <laughs>